So I think what we're going to do today is uh, the same thing that we did last time, which is uh, we are going to present a case. I'm going to give you some history. Uh, I'm going to let you review the case for maybe a minute or so, depends on how many images we have. And then uh, I will dictate, give you my opinion, and then uh, we'll maybe leave a couple of minutes if people have particular questions about the, the RADs. All right. So let's just... Let's go for it. All right. So this is a um, four-month-old cat that is uh, Tachypnic. A left lateral view, a right lateral view, and a VD view. All right. Three views of the thorax. Period, new line. The cardiac silhouette is normal in size for the patient's young age. Period. The trachea is normal in luminal diameter and course. Period. The cranial mediastinum is within normal limits, period. The pleural space is normal, period. The size of the liver is normal for the patient's young age, period. Numerous open physes are consistent with the patient's younger age, period. The lungs are well inflated, and despite the well inflated lungs, come there is a mild diffuse bronchial to bronchial interstitial pattern, period. Thoracic lymphadenopathy is absent, period. New line. Numeral one, period. Mild diffuse bronchial interstitial pattern, Dash, given the history of tachypnea, comma, consider causes of lower airway inflammation to include inhaled irritant, comma, infectious slash parasitic pneumonitis, open print, e.g., mycoplasma, comma, lurostrongulus, or other closed print, and less likely feline asthma, period. New line two period, otherwise, comma, normal age appropriate thorax. This case is over. Anybody have any questions, concerns, comments? Pretty straightforward. Would have said large liver. Yeah, so young cats have a, uh, young cats and young dogs, the size of the liver are relative to the body size. It looks big. Um, and that's a game sometimes that you have to play with. Is it too big for the size and, uh, sorry, of the age of the patient? But I think this is totally fine. Um, it's a really young cat. And so the cardiac silhouettes always look kind of chunky and the livers always look too big. Pulled a, a couple of cool cases from earlier. Let's see. Okay, so this are two views of the thorax. This is a um, this is a five year old dog that was recently at a boarding facility and is tachypnic uh, and coughing. Okay, so uh, let's give you another minute to figure out what's going on. Only two views. This is a right lateral view and a VD view. Okay, two views of the thorax. The patient is obese, period. The cardiac silhouette and pulmonary blood vessels are normal, period. The impression of a heart-based mass effect is the result of incidental fat, period. There is no abnormal widening of the mediastinum on the VD view, period. The degree of widening on the VD view is attributed to fat, period. Increased soft tissue opacity completely effaces pulmonary blood vessels in the right cranial lung lobe and yields a low bar sign with the adjacent right middle lung lobe, period. The cranial abdomen is normal, period. The pleural space is normal, period. Thoracic lymphadenopathy is absent, period. Maybe a little bit of OA in the shoulder joints. So this patient has right cranial lung pneumonia, and it was just boarded, so it's infectious pneumonia until proven otherwise, despite the fact that it's cranial and ventral. It could still be in, uh, infectious pneumonia. It could be uh, influenza. It could be bordetella could still be aspiration pneumonia. The dog is obese. That is it. That's all I see on here. Um, anybody have any questions or concerns or comments about this one? This is an obese dog with pneumonia. I would encourage you to do three views of the thorax at your clinics because this would have been very obvious if you would have had a left lateral view. This thing would have popped up right here. So um, we don't see it really well because it's in the dependent or down lung. So this patient, uh, is the right side is on the table and that results in, uh, under inflation of that lung. Um, yeah, there is air in the esophagus right here. That's fine. A little transient esophageal gas, very common to see it right here. Uh, no big deal. Plus we wouldn't be surprised too, if the dog's trying to gasp for air because he's got pneumonia, he's being restrained most likely against his will on the table. So a lot of reasons to tough and puff. Is there a mediastinal shift to the left or position or fat? This is a DV view. And so you've got one uh, sort of 
dome, the cupola of the diaphragm kind of poops off here. So on a VD view, you have this sort of, they call it Mickey Mouse, or you have the three humps. So this is one view. And an obese dog on a DV view that's expiratory. So that that diaphragm pushes up and it's going to, there's, there's only so much space uh, that everything can move in that enclosed chest. And so it's going to push the, the cardiac silhouette over to the left. So you get that sort of deviation. Um, but this is the cranial lung lobe and it's coming up here to the first rib. So it's good. I mean, he's taking a pretty good breath on that left cranial lung lobe. Uh, it's an alveolar pattern for sure. It's an alveolar pattern only because when we say alveolar, uh, one of the criteria that you can use for alveolar is a low bar sign. So this line right here, you can see that line right there because this has too much opacity and this has gas. And so there's your pneumonia and there's more normal lung. Uh, if we would have had the left lateral view, maybe you see an air bronchogram. You don't always see the air bronchogram because if it, the air bronchogram fills with pus, it'll just obscure it. And so then you'll just have sort of an, a whiteout. Uh, so in this particular case, uh, this is an alveolar pattern, pneumonia, pneumonia, pneumonia. Next differential would be pneumonia. And then after that, it's going to be pneumonia again. And then after that, it could be hemorrhage. Um, maybe if you're in Southern California, they have migrating foreign objects like plant ons can you guys tell that i'm in an urban area with all the uh the noise okay so there we go number two in the bank okay so this one i don't know if it's cool but we'll just see what you guys say so this is three views of the abdomen um and in a dog that's acutely vomiting okay so uh, i'll give you 30 seconds to to take a stab at it and um, I want you to tell me if you think the dog has a GI obstruction, right? I mean, vomiting dogs, this is really what we're doing. We're trying to figure out, of course, a cause for vomiting, but we also want to know, does the dog have an obstruction? So here we go. Okay. I do it in the same order every time, sort of like a machine. And uh, the machines are coming for my job. But for right now, you got me. So Caudal thorax is normal. Make sure you don't have any pneumonia. The liver is fine, even though there's a little bit of cranial positioning of the gastric access. There's the spleen. There's one kidney. There's the other kidney. They kind of overlap. They usually separate a little bit better on the right lateral view. There's the left kidney. There's the right kidney. This is blurry. It's motion artifacts. So the dog moved at the time of acquisition. You can see how it's a little more crisp here. The urinary bladder is tiny. So here's the stomach, gas, a little bit of fluid, left lateral view, pylorus is gas filled. That's great. Last week we had this discussion about right versus left lateral. Here's the pylorus with the right lateral. So if you, if you drop the dog on the table gently, okay, and you put them in right lateral view, okay, this side is down. All the fluid and stuff should go here and it should look like this. Then if you gently flip the dog onto the left lateral view, all the fluid should go down onto the fundus and body. And then this pylorus on the left lateral view should be gas filled. So we like to draw attention to that. Make sure we don't have some sort of nugget form body sitting there. Okay. The other thing we talked about is anything in here is fair game for colon. So all this is fluidy, gas filled colon, fluidy, gas filled colon. This is probably the cecum. This kind of comes up here like this, loops around. Everything is kind of uh, following uh the the way that it should be so this is a dog with gastroenterocolitis no obstruction this is one of those cases where i'm very confident the dog is not obstructed so i don't think you need to come back and image the dog at all uh the only reason maybe to image is if it hasn't responded well especially to vomiting within 24 hours after supportive after starting the supportive care let's go for some uh some unknown rads okay this is where it gets a little a little more nerve wracking. This is a 23 month old dog. There are two radiographs. Diarrhea started overnight on Wednesday. It's continued intermittently until today. The owner withheld food for a day to see if that would help. When she gave her food again tonight, she didn't eat it, but then a diarrhea again. She ate, now she's vomiting. She has a history of eating absolutely everything. All right, so here we go. So First thing that caught my eye, I was like, well, is there too much down here? But I actually think there's a rib. So the cardiac, the caudal aspect of the, the uh, chest is fine. The liver is fine. The spleen is fine. One kidney, two kidney, fine. Urinary bladder, small and fluid opaque, fine. Here's colon. I kind of lose it, but it's probably through here. 
This has incompletely formed feces. The dog's ileal wings are, are uh, rotated, so he's a little bit tipped off, and that may contribute to why you're seeing the disc spaces through here look a little narrowed. Okay, but to be honest with you, the first thing that caught my eye was, was this. So, uh, you know, my, my, what's going through my head is what's going on down here? Do we have any food, foreign material? Why is there something down here? Um, you flip him over on his back, normal left kidney, splenic head is fine. This is the duodenum. That's fine. The things that are keep catching my eye are what's going on here, though we know that's in the area of the, uh, the iliocolic junction. The stomach is less, uh, bothersome here, but maybe there's something kind of here. So so we've got some poorly formed feces, which supports the history of diarrhea. The stomach is not overly distended, but there is something that's kind of in here. And that could be foreign material. It's a vomiting dog. Really shouldn't have anything in the stomach if you're vomiting, though you could have residual food or mucus or blood clots, but this could be foreign material. So then the next thing is we got to tell the clinician, do we have to do something like right now? Uh, can we wait? So we want to make sure, do we think that there's a pyloric outflow? obstruction but this is the duodenum and it's pretty darn straight so my guess is no this area is in the region of the iliocolic junction and it can get kind of busy but you also have the, the distal aspect of the right limb of the pancreas could cause a little bit of reduced serosal detail not really i'm getting pretty good serosal detail in the lateral view you got to chill out on vd views because everybody always looks like they got a reduction in serosal detail there's the patient's thicker so the x-ray beam when it goes through the patient when they're on their back tends to get scattered more and that scatter radiation can contribute to the impression of a reduced uh, serosal detail but we talk about small intestine you hear me talk about size course and content so the size does everybody look the same we all at the same party so these look pretty good these look pretty good this thing kind of caught my eye right here maybe that's the duodenum with a little bit of fluid um, or wall thickening Everybody's making gentle turns, gentle turns. So the course, intestine back here, intestine back here, intestine up here. I agree this area is a little bit interesting to me, but it could be kind of in here, which is the iliocolic junction. So I think for this particular patient, I would say I'm, I'm not convinced the dog has an obstruction. Um, I am interested. One of the nice things about reading RADS before you get a history is you can form an opinion without being biased. And this caught my eye. And so now I'm wondering, like, is that something real? So I think you could do one of two things. You could fast the dog for 12 hours, give them supportive care, repeat the RADS and see if that's still there because it shouldn't be. Um, you could do an ultrasound now uh, to see if it's got some sort of unusual shadowing characteristics that would make you think that it's foreign. Um, that's probably all I would do. I don't think you need to do an ultrasound right now, even though there's this area right here. Um, but I, I think... Not obstructed dog, maybe some foreign material, and because of the history of eating everything and because of the vomiting with the presence of gastric material, I would follow up um, in this particular patient with a 12-hour fast and repeat RADS to see if it's gone. Okay, I don't know if you guys will find this one interesting. This is a physics, just sort of a quick physics lesson, okay? So, so on the left-hand screen is a left lateral view. On the right-hand screen is a right lateral view. This is a dog. It's obese. You can tell it's a right lateral view, not only because of the Mitchell marker, but the diaphragm are parallel. And then on the left lateral view, um, the diaphragm diverge. Right here, there's something abnormal. So there's sort of this appearance of a mass right here. And then you can kind of see it vaguely right here. So if you took my word for it without the VD view, so we've got a VD view and I'm going to show you, but there is a mass and it's in the lung here and here based on these two, which lung do you think it's in the left side or the right side? You've got a 50, 50 shot. Definitely a lung mass. Definitely. Um, on one of the sides, it's not like on the table. It's not a trick question. Yeah. So everybody's saying left and I, and I agree. Uh, so one of the things about the, the reason that it's left, there are two reasons. Um, there are three that we could talk about, but, but one in particular that I thought was very interesting. So this, this mass is in the left lung. Okay. You can see it, it's right here. 
a couple of things to note. It's peripheral, so maybe you could find it with ultrasound. You could harpoon it with a, an ultra, you know, with a, an aspirate. But one of the things that is important to show is that when you put the dog in left lateral recumbency, so you put the, the patient's left side on the table, the lung on the downside, on the left side, it pulls up toward the hilum, so it pulls things up. So you'll see this is more dorsal relative to this because it's been pulled up. The other thing is this now is the left side is up, and because the left side is up, it's surrounded by gas. And I think we've talked about differential attenuation. So more gas, more black, it surrounds the white structure. And so it stands out more. Other things too, is it's magnified. So it tends to be, it can be bigger and it can be more, uh, more, um, almost appear more opaque. So left cranial lung mass, it's solitary. This could be a primary carcinoma. It's possible that it's a MET, but usually you have multiple nodules with a MET. Um, could be a granuloma in the Midwest of the United States. You get a lot of blastomycosis, which can be more disseminated, but sometimes um, mycotic pneumonia can show up as a, a pulmonary mass. Okay, that one was more of a, a physics lesson. Let's see, I'm gonna get another case here. Yeah, so the lung being pulled. So when you put the dog down on the side, whatever side is touching the table, so when you, you put the dog on their side and whatever side is, if this is the table, it's pulled up because it, it, it has a little bit of atelectasis. It retracts toward the hilum. So it kind of is, it just naturally retracts upwards. And because it retracts upwards, when you take the lateral view, it actually looks like it's more dorsal. So it's offset by pulling up. Um, okay. Three views of the abdomen, acute vomiting and a dog. Here's the right lateral view. Here is the left lateral view, and here is the VD view. So right lateral view, pylorus filled with fluid, left lateral view, still some fluid because there's a lot of fluid. Here's the, here's the stomach, right? So pylorus has a little bit of gas. This is probably the proximal duodenum. Everybody's kind of getting it, which is great. So again, because we use our stepwise approach, right? We notice that he's got pneumonia in his right middle lung lobe. Okay, it's left lateral view. He's rotated probably because he's uncomfortable and scared, but he's got pneumonia right here. You would confirm that by taking three views of the thorax, but I think I would rather be wrong, um, but that's, that's pneumonia. His liver is fine. There's one kidney. Here's the other kidney. This is his colon. It's corrugated, so it's angry. Stomach full of fluid and gas. It redistributes with changes in recumbency. So left lateral view, it's gas filled. Right lateral view, it's fluid filled, but this structure is not normal. And here it is still here, pretty ventral. He's rotated, right? So we talked about the colon potentially dipping down when with pretty marked rotation, but this is not colon and this is not colon. So that is an empty loop and this is a big loop and this is a foreign body in another loop and it's right over here. And so when you see that two populations, a foreign body, stomach full of fluid, you cut the dog and treat him for pneumonia. So this is an obstruction. Now, let's say you were like, wait, wait, wait. I'm not convinced that he's obstructed. I'm nervous. If you're like me, you don't want to cut dogs um, because it's stressful and you just sweat. One of the things that you could do is you could do a pneumoclonogram. So you find an intern or some somebody else who pulls the short straw and you, you put a bunch of gas into the colon and you'll notice that the gas will cruise right by this sucker. And so that'll help you confirm that this is uh, in fact in the small intestine. Other things that you could do, you could take a wooden spatula. Uh, dogs love this, but you take a wooden spoon or a wooden spatula and you can just press it straight into the belly and take the rat at the same time. And that spatula move will, uh, yeah. Fiona talks about a wooden spoon to highlight. Yeah, you can smash that, that intestine. It displaces stuff and it makes things uh, surprisingly more clear. Um, okay. This is three views in a middle-aged dog that is coughing. This is a right lateral view. This is a left lateral view, and this is a VD view. Three views of the thorax. This is an, the, the patient is obese. The cardiac silhouette is normal. The pulmonary blood vessels are normal. The trachea is normal in luminal diameter and course. The cranial mediastinum is normal. 
There's no widening. The pleural space is normal. Okay. This is not pleural fluid. Don't be, don't be fooled. Okay. This is the cardiac silhouette, which we know is soft tissue with fluid. And we can see the border because something that's less opaque is next to it. And that's fat. So this is gas. This is soft tissue and this is fat. So gas, fat, soft tissue. I can see that border and we can see this border because it's again bordered by something less opaque. So if it was fluid, you would have a border effacement. You'd lose that border and you wouldn't see it. So this is not fluid. The liver is fine, nice and sharp. Uh, stomach is fine. I usually just say cranial abdomen, normal or abnormal. Um, but the lung's not normal, okay? So there's too much funk in here. Opaque, I wouldn't use funk. Victoria, don't use funk. So patchy alveolar pattern in the left cranial and the right middle and the left cranial lung lobe. You flip them on their back to confirm you've got something here, something here, and something here. Now, this is interesting because it's so cute and triangular. So this right middle lung lobe is actually collapsed, partially collapsed, which gives you that sort of triangular shape. Okay, so increased opacity here, here, and here. This is pneumonia, pneumonia, pneumonia. Okay, so uh, pulmonary hemorrhage maybe less, migrating foreign body less. Um, one of the things about report writing that, that I like to use is normal or abnormal, just very simple sentences, normal or abnormal. Now you could say, I could say that this cardiac silhouette is normal. And then somebody would say, well, it's not normal because he's got a murmur and he's got some mitral valve disease. But the thing is the test that I have, which is the red, it's normal. And so, uh, I tend to avoid the word unremarkable, because if it's unremarkable, then you could be a little snide and say, well, why are you remarking on it? So I like normal, abnormal. Um, and then I usually describe why it's normal or abnormal. Okay. Three views of the thorax. Yeah. So, uh, the last case possible plural fluid. I think maybe we went through that. Let me know if, if you don't, if you didn't get it or, or you need me to, to go back over it. But, um, the diagnosis for the last one was just pneumonia, just straight up pneumonia, 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 pneumonia. Yeah. Don't make it any more complicated. You just treat them for pneumonia. You know, I, I think a lot of times, at least I was trained that, yeah, it's not great for antibiotic resistance and, and things like that, but you're better off missing a pulmonary med. I, I think everybody freaks out that they're going to miss these nod, like a nodule, but the dog with cancer, he's going to come back uh, the dog with pneumonia is going to come back potentially dead. So you would rather err on the side of the dog's got pneumonia. Um, you know, so the last case did not have pleural fluid. There was no pleural fluid in that dog. It was sort of a fake out pleural fluid. And the reason that it was a fake out pleural fluid is because the right middle lung lobe was collapsed is atelectasis. So this looks more opaque, but the only reason this looks more opaque is because it doesn't have the lung over it. And part of the lung that is probably here has no air in it and maybe concurrent pus. If you take a lung, just generally speaking, if you take a lung lobe and you, and you, and you say there's an alveolar pattern in the lung lobe, you should really, your mind should then go, okay, is the lung lobe too small? In which case it's atelectasis. If you pull the gas out of the lung lobe, it'll collapse and you'll get an alveolar pattern, but it looks small like this. See how this looks triangular? That's a collapsed lung lobe. It collapses out toward the periphery and it kind of goes up toward the hilum. Okay. And the reason you can't see the margin of the cardiac silhouette is because this is fluid soft tissue and the lung is fluid slash soft tissue. Okay. So you take a lung lobe and you say there's an alveolar pattern. If it's underinflated or triangular like this, or it kind of looks like this triangular sort of appearance like that, that's atelectasis. If you take the lung lobe and it's normal in size, then it's there's something in it, blood, pus, or fluid. And then if you take the lung lobe and you have an alveolar pattern and the borders are maybe bulbous or they extend beyond the boundary, then you start thinking that there's a mass in there. So this dog has pneumonia in this lobe, which is right here. And then the dog also has pneumonia here. That's too much. And then the dog probably has pneumonia in here, but at least from the standpoint of 
imaging, this lung is mostly collapsed. Victoria was all the miliary pattern. Let's go back to that one. Yeah, that that's okay. So this is three views of the thorax. So this lung has a severe diffuse miliary pattern. There's getting maybe a little bit of an alveolar component here, though the dog is rotated. Yeah, generalized miliary. This is fungal. This could be, um, this ended up being blastomycosis. This could be neoplasia. Sometimes uh, METs will, will look this way. So uh, the trachea is fine. This area right here, as it kind of comes off, these are bronchial walls. They may be a little bit thick, which is why they're so opaque and you're seeing them end on. But here's the carina. So the trachea is fine. Larynx is fine. Liver is skimpy. I don't know the breed. Maybe it's a, a gray, Italian greyhound or something, but this liver is a little too small. There's also a fractured rib. See it right here. So that rib's fractured, and I don't see callus. So it's probably an acute fracture. These caudal ribs, you can fracture them when you cough. Um, so we're not really suspecting trauma or abuse or anything like that. Uh, so I would say microhepatica. Could be a normal variant. Check the blood work. Any hepatobiliary enzyme abnormalities? Maybe you take it a step further and you do a bile acids. You could also do a protein C analysis. It could be chronic hepatitis, or I would also say it could be a vascular anomaly. So it could be a portosystemic shunt, like a macroscopic portosystemic shunt that we classically think of, like a splenophrenic or a splenazygous shunt. You could also have uh, microvascular dysplasia. I think the heart looks round and kind of big because uh, in part because the dog is rotated. So here's the sternum right here. So the dog is tipped off and that's causing it to sort of bow out like that. So one of the things that you go, okay, the heart looks kind of big. The cardiac silhouette looks too big on the VD view. So what looks too big, kind of the right side. You could open up rads, close your eyes and say the dog does not have right-sided cardiomegaly because it's really not common. But in this particular case, you go, okay, maybe he's got right-sided cardiomegaly. But then you look over here and you're like, man, it just doesn't look too wide. Right-sided cardiomegaly, it tends to, to dip down. But I can see where your head's going because then you're like, well, the dog's got this really bad lung pattern and maybe it's chronic. And then you've had this increased pulmonary pressure or pulmonary hypertension. And then you get remodeling on the right side of the heart. Um, and then you'd have right-sided cardiomegaly. But since this we know is for sure fungal, it's not that chronic. Um, and so I, I don't think that the right side of the cardiac silhouette is, is, is that big. I will tell you that our ability to diagnose right-sided cardiomegaly and, and in particular pulmonary hypertension is it's not great. And here's the dog after treatment. It's getting better, right? See the cardiac silhouettes. Some of that may be fat too. I don't know. I don't really think that there's right-sided cardiomegaly. I think that should dump down a little bit. The other thing, too, that I like to, um, the BSAVA, there's a thoracic uh, BSAVA book that I, I picked up one time that talked about the cardiac apex. Um, I'll show you in another case, but it's normal for the cardiac apex on a left lateral view to be dorsal from the sternum. It's a normal thing, but it's not so normal on the right. But if you see it on the right, uh, then you can kind of start to wonder, does the dog also have uh, right-sided cardiomegaly? I'll give you one minute to look at this. There are three views of the thorax. There's a right lateral, a left lateral, and a VD view. All right, three views of the thorax. The patient has a large body habitus. Most of the animals, I feel like, in America are, are obese. So this patient, you can tell that he's old, right? He's got, or he's likely old. He's got spondylosis deformans. Some of these disc spaces are collapsed. Yeah, I'm just reading some uh, reading reading some comments. So left side of left side of cardiomegaly. So the cardiac silhouette is enlarged, characterized by mildly to moderately enlarged, mildly left uh, mildly enlarged left atrium. The thoracic trachea is deviated a little dorsally. There's a subtle left auricular bulge right here, two to three o'clock. That's your left atrium. Way too much going on here, right? So this is the cowboy or cowgirl sign where there's just too much opacity. So when the x-ray beam comes down, it hits all this extra tissue 
which stops it from getting to the detector. And so it just looks more opaque. So you've got moderate, mild to moderate left-sided cardiomegaly. Next question, any cardiogenic pulmonary edema? This patient is coughing, Lucy. It's a coughing animal, right? So usually I feel like these cases, there's a historical heart murmur. The animal's coughing. The owner is, is uh, if they're like me, they're hyper aware of any symptoms. And then when the animal is off a little bit, they, they sort of rush in and think, the uh, the patient is going to be in heart failure. I'm very doom or gloom, but this patient is not in heart failure. So uh, there's no evidence of edema here. There's no evidence on any of the views. There's a little bit of gas in the esophagus. I wouldn't even comment on that. That's so common. These little nuggets right here, they're all incidental mineral. Other things, uh, that's probably a, a renal lith or nephrolith. I mean, you got to be careful because he's rotated and there's GI, you know, but is that a kidney stone? I, maybe, I wonder. Um, cranial mediastinum is fine. There's no thoracic lymphadenopathy, no thoracic lymphadenopathy, no pleural fluid. You can see that margin so well. You can see that margin so well. Um, okay, so the coughing could be impingement. You know, these left atria, the left atrium can impinge on the principal bronchi. So one of the things to dis to decide if this opacity in the perihilar region is the heart or is it pulmonary edema is you can follow this line all the way up like this. Okay. And then you go, oh, wow, it kind of connects. Okay. So when you can connect that line, it's game on. So what you do is you use, I, you use and should use the orthogonal view, orthogonal meaning 90 degrees, so a lateral and a DV or VD to support your case. If you are so confident, but you can only see it on one view, you should chill out, right? So this cardiac silhouette goes up like this and you go, wow, that feels like the heart. Maybe it's fluid. Maybe it's the heart. When you flip the dog on the back, you go, there's something, there's too much here. There's just way too much opacity here. And so that supports my suspicion. But if you thought this could be the lung and he's in heart failure, then you flip the dog on the back and you're like, well, I don't know, man. It doesn't look that awful back here. If it looks this awful on the lateral view, if it's that obvious on the lateral view, it should be damn obvious on the VD and I'm just not seeing it. So, and again, we talked last time, do a DV view. You'd put the dog on their sternum and the rad, the the photon, the X-ray beam comes down this way, and you're going to really start to see a ton of. Um, it's just much more obvious to have cardiogenic pulmonary edema on a DV view. The one caveat to this sort of follow the yellow brick road is you will, and it happens a lot, is you'll get a rib that'll sit right over here, and then you'll follow the rib, and you'll be like, ah, oh, it's the the left side of the heart's too big, but in that particular case. When you flip the dog over, you're not you're not getting this. So I, I think as a general practitioner, you should start making confident decisions when you can confirm it on orthogonal or views that are 90 degrees to one another. And, I, you know, if you send me a study and you didn't feel comfortable to diagnose something and it wasn't really confirmed on orthogonal views, I feel like that's totally fine because it's hard. But this, you got to be careful. The rib will will fake you out. And it will make you look like it'll make you think that the dog's got left-sided cardiomegaly. But when you do the orthogonal view and you don't have that, you should you should then uh, relax a little bit. Okay, this dog is in respiratory distress. Uh, quit pet peeve. See this right here. This just it just it's like trying to look at the rad with somebody shining a flashlight on you. So. I'm going to give you a, a minute to look at this. Okay, so this is a right lateral view a DV view and a left lateral view. Okay. And the one thing you can't say, cause it's vet tech week here in, in the U S you can't say retake these rads. They're crooked. I, my suspicion is that mm, you may struggle with this case. I, I think this is a bit of a difficult one. Okay. Anybody see anything wrong? Any abnormalities? Or you want me to just tell you what I think? And then uh, you can, Remember at the beginning I said we were going to do this this format and I just destroyed the format. This format feels better. Lucy, Dr. Lucy says possible non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Okay. 
So first things first, the, you got to crop those out. Okay. That, that's, that's, it's difficult. The dog is obese because we're in America. The dog is rotated because he's trying to die. This poor dog. He's rotated. He's rotated. He's rotated. Okay. Given the rotation, I think the techs have done great. This is, they, they, they got confused. So this is not a right lateral view, right? So always use the patient's anatomy. So this is the, they've, they've mislabeled it. So this is the fundus. There's the splenic head. So this is left, okay? This cute little transitional thing is just cute. So there's right lateral. This is the left side and this is the right side. So it's mislabeled, okay? So the first thing that you do is you go, are the lungs normal or not normal? And I think everybody based on their, what they were saying is that the lungs are not normal. The next thing that you should do is you should decide are the lungs, what you can do is you can sort of figuratively in your mind, draw a line through the cardiac silhouette and decide are the lungs worse craniovental or caudodorsal? Are the lungs worse craniovental or caudodorsal? You guys tell me. Craniovental here or here? Where is it worse? Cranioventral, is it worse here or there? It's like the eye exam test. Here or here? Caudodorsal, caudodorsal, yeah. Okay, so we're not even going to look at the VD, the DV view right now. Caudodorsal, I agree. It's worse caudodorsal. When you see a predominantly, caud this lung is not particularly normal. This lung is not normal. You can kind of see like a low bar sign right here. So this is getting a little heavy if you want to talk about heavy. But here it is, right? So a little too much here, a little too much here, a little too much here. So it's a bit of an unusual pattern in that it seems to be a bit sort of uh, almost random in that it's this low left cranial. This is the caudal subsegment of the left cranial. This is the right cranial. This is the right caudal. But when you put the dog on their side, it is worse caudal dorsally, okay? And right away, you should think of two things. It's either cardiogenic pulmonary edema or non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And that's really it. We can talk about viral pneumonia or leptospirosis or, you know, PTEs. But just playing the odds, probability, it's cardiogenic or non-cardiogenic. Non-cardiogenic we look at like 12 to 13,000 studies a year, and it is so much less common than cardiogenic. Okay, so I think the cardiac silhouette is a little too tall, but it, we could be faked out because the dog is rotated. Okay, so on the DV view, I'm not really getting any sort of left auricular bulge. These pulmonary blood vessels are kind of tapering. There's no left atrial sign, okay? So we don't have the benefit of the DV of this view saying what our eyes are telling us on this view. So it looks kind of tall, looks kind of tall. This is a rib, but we're not getting our confirmation. So we're worried that maybe the heart's a little bit too big, but we don't have a slam dunk. It could be non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema or cardiogenic pulmonary edema. If you don't have a heart murmur, usually from here, you'll, you'll have the benefit of the doubt with a heart murmur or you'll have history, right? The history, it's electrocution case, um, near drowning case, upper airway obstruction, laryngeal paralysis, seizures, really, really, really bad seizures, though I don't see that as commonly. This dog had a ruptured chordae tendinae and it's heart failure. So you'll get the, these, this case is you'll get lucky because the cardiac silhouette is not that big, but there's a raging heart murmur. So it is grade four, five um, out of six. And uh, it's because they blew a cord. Okay. So keeping it simple because this is a bit of a, it's a wonky case because you don't have the slam dunk heart. And then you got sort of this weird involvement or not weird, but this sort of less typical involvement of some of these cranial lung lobes and more than just your classic caudodorsal lung pattern. So caudodorsal, non-cardiogenic cardiogenic, uh, or cardiogenic pulmonary edema. The other thing that you could do is you could do a furosemide trial. You give the dog Lasix and if this is cardiogenic pulmonary edema, cardiogenic pulmonary edema is from increased hydrostatic pressure. And that hydrostatic pressure results in low protein fluid in the lung. And that low, that low protein fluid loves 
to respond to doses of furosemide. And so you'll see a clinical and radiographic improvement fairly quickly in cases of cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Uh, the, the vessels don't look, yes. I, I am very cautious about using um, blood vessels to push me one way or another in, in the teleradiology setting. I think this dog had a dose of furosemide prior to the study, and sometimes we don't get that information. And so um, that's one instance when maybe the vessels won't be big. Another instance I feel like is if there's an animal that has chronic heart disease and he's been on chronic medication, plus or minus has had previous episodes of heart failure, you don't always get the the classic venous engorgement, venous distension, um, and things like that. So this is one of those where you go, we got a lung, the lungs are not normal. Check. Caudal dorsal is worse. Check. It's cardiogenic or non-cardiogenic. Check. There's nothing in the history to suggest a non-cardiogenic origin. Oh, by the way, I hear a murmur game on Lasix, um, and, and get an echo. And this is the liver. This is a massive liver. Okay. So liver is huge. Part of it may be from congestion, uh, but I, I think there's also some in this left kidney maybe is a little bit big. I think this is the right kidney that we're seeing, and we're seeing it fairly well, air quotes, because of uh, the rotation. But this is probably a diabetic, uh, if I had to guess, big kidneys, big liver, uh, big dog. So uh, that's that case. Okay, this is uh, a dog that's coughing. But what we're going to do is I'm just, there's a decent number of cases over here, but I'm just going to do three. All right. Anybody see anything wrong with this dog? A uh, reason to explain the coughing. Bronchitis. We got bronchitis. So one of the, the, uh, the things to consider is this, my mentor used to tell me, maybe I said this last time, but he said that bronchial patterns, stop me if you've heard this, bronchial patterns are like assholes, everybody's got one. So the asshole analogy and this particular clinic, their technique is very bronchial. So everybody in this particular clinic, uh, which you guys obviously wouldn't know, looks like they've got a bronchial pattern. So you're not wrong to say these are donuts. Donut, 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 donut. But this is this is it. And I really wanted to show you this case because this is a left lateral view and this is the right middle lung lobe. And these can get missed because it's so perfectly superimposed with the cardiac silhouette and it's only subtly more opaque, right? So gray of the heart, white or opaque, that's a rib, but this is too opaque, opaque, rib, rib. And these are your bronchograms, these little arborizing structures. Okay. So there's pus around gas that's trapped into these distal bronchi. This nugget right here, this is fine. Let's see. That's probably, um, this is normal. I see this a lot. That's just, uh, probably fat in the mediastinum. I bet if we pulled the, the, the thoracic limbs forward, this would maybe sort of attenuate somewhat. Um, the other thing to consider is if you thought this is C7, T1. So if you thought there's a mass at C7, you could flip the dog on their back and, uh, you don't really have it right here, but this lung kind of comes out right here and I'm not getting any sort of uh, deformation here. I see that a lot. I, that used to be uh, an area of concern during my residency. And when you freak out enough, it's like buying a yellow car and then everybody's got a yellow car. Uh, or you see yellow cars everywhere. This is pneumonia, 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 pneumonia. Okay. It's a this is your classic pneumonia right here. Okay. That's it. There's nothing else wrong. There's no pleural fluid. You can see the margin of the cardiac silhouette, the liver diaphragm. There's no mass here. The trachea is here. The cardiac silhouette is fine. This is kind of going this way. 
And this is kind of this flamboyant curve is because the pulmonary veins are coming in, not because it's lost or, or straight up. So there's no left-sided cardiomegaly in this dog. Look at this. It, it look, you go, whoa, whoa. So that's a pulmonary vein coming in. So left atrial enlargement, it would come up and it would just go straight or it would go out. So that's normal. I think there's a bronchial pattern. I think that's fair. There's probably a real one in this dog. Should we call it quits? Should we do one more? It's like midnight or 2 a.m. with some, some folks. Let's see. Three views of the thorax. Woo-wee, this is a cool one. 10 a.m. here. Oh, is that Australia? The signalman on this dog, too, is he's an older, um, large breed. I think it's like a Labrador. Cardiac silhouette that's maybe small. Soft tissue opacity caudal to the cardiac silhouette between the aorta and the, this thing. Dr. Allen is, this, this is rotten. Dr. Allen does not like this. Okay, so what could you use to describe the margins? Are they sharp? Is it rounded, bulgy? And then when you flip the dog onto the right side, it's still kind of here, but it's less there. And then when you flip the dog on the back, okay, granted, this is kind of cutting off back here, right? Because you're, you're, there's probably something right here. Yeah. So here's what I see. The cardiac silhouette is get, it's, it's fairly small. The caudal vena cava will change size with changes in respiration, but on these two lateral views, it's still kind of skimpy and the pulmonary blood vessels here are kind of skimpy. You could measure the size of the cardiac silhouette. I don't know if anybody really wants me to do the VHS, but if this thing is like, I think 9.5 plus or minus 0.7 is normal. So if you're talking eight, eight ish, if this is like an eight, you know, it's too small. So we would call microcardia. This right here, this opacity right here is attenuating approximately half of the caudal cervical or the mid-cervical uh, trachea. And in a large dog, you could say that that's either uh, a redundant esophagus is what we would say, or like esophageal draping. The other thing in this particular case is if the dog has laryngeal paralysis and they're sucking on a closed glottis, that it will cause that membrane to to invaginate. And so I think that's probably what's going on. And the reason I do is because there's, I would describe this when I started as a mass in the caudal thorax in that area of the caudal esophagus. So this kind of goes here and it comes confluent with that. And this kind of goes out here like that. So there is like a soft tissue mass, but it's less noticeable. It's still there, but it's less noticeable. So what kind of neoplasms change that drastically between lateral views? And so in this particular case, we made a case, I made a case that the dog, and of course, uh, there's probably strider and you can always ask the clinician, but if you've got an upper airway etiology like LARPAR, it'll drop this, it'll cause invagination here. It'll cause a sliding hiatal hernia. So that's exactly what uh, Dr. Lucy said is a sliding hiatal hernia. But the other thing to consider too is right here, a little bit of love. That's focal pneumonia in the, in the ventral aspect of the right middle lung lobe. Okay, so I think this particular case has a little bit of microcardia, got a hiatal hernia, got uh, membrane invagination here dorsally, aspiration pneumonia, um, and I would be looking at LARPAR. If you didn't know what in the world this was and you were freaked out that it's a mass uh, or a granuloma or a foreign body, you could give barium. You take a little bit of barium. Uh, a quarter size barium, you throw it on top of the, the roof of his mouth, you put him on the table, you fire off VD and lateral views. And this should, uh, you should see it kind of either go away or kind of go around. Um, but that's one way to, to consider it as well. All right. I think that's it. Any questions on this particular case? In smaller dogs, which get primary tracheal collapse, how do you differentiate between dorsal number? I think it's hard. It is, it is hard. Uh, so, Dr. Lucy is asking, in smaller dogs, which get primary tracheal collapse from chondromalacia, it's hard. Yeah, and so I think that's why you get these shitty radiograph reports where it's like, I don't know, it's like tracheitis or chondromalacia or upper airway obstruction. Because if you have a brachycephalic and they, you know, they're the ones that get tracheal collapse or one of the, the breeds that'll get it, they also can't breathe. And so they, uh, you know, they, 
try to breathe against a closed glottis brachycephalic airway disease. That'll cause the membrane to go in. Uh, one of the things you could do if you don't have fluoroscopy, obviously, is you could attempt to acquire peak inspiratory and peak expiratory lateral views to see if there's a marked difference. I also use the degree of collapse. If you've got a small dog that has all the clinical signs and that trachea is in like 75% and it's pretty badly collapsed, and then maybe you take the next view and it looks a bit more normal or dynamic, that's when I start to worry that you've got dynamic chondromalacia. I don't know if that helps, but it, it can it can be hard. Um, but all right, that's it. I got to go to lunch. The rest of you got to go to work. Thank you very much. I will uh, send out a message for next week and uh, also discussing, uh, I tend to do this where I overdo it, but I'm, I'm thinking about rolling something out um, midweek that has a time that's a little better for uh, some of the folks overseas. So uh, stay tuned and uh, thanks for joining. Talk to you guys soon. Bye.